So I'm here to speak to you about a topic which I'm incredibly passionate about, and that is the Constitution. Now, our Constitution is a normative document, or an aspirational document. It looks at where we were, where we came from, apartheid, like I said, raining on the parade of hope. But, so it looks at where we were, this apartheid system, and it says, never, ever, ever again do we ever want to have that. So it says, let's take a 180 degree turn to a point Y on this transformation curve which we have over here. So from point X, where we were, apartheid, to point Y, the Constitution sets out the rules and guidelines on how to get there. And this, ladies and gentlemen, this movement from where we were to where we want to be is what we call, and nobody freak out, transformation. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> this kind of buzzword which seems to have been so tarnished by politics and misunderstandings is really something which encapsulates our Constitution. It's something which we all want. It's positive change. So let's adopt this idea of transformation as it's meant to be, the positive movement forward. So our Constitution acts as a roadmap. And like any roadmap, it's only really worth the paper that it's printed on. And it allows us the direction to move from where we were to where we want to be. And where we want to be is a society based on human dignity, equality, and freedom. So for yourselves, with this little red dot, I'd like you to, to plot a position from where we were to where we are, where we want to be as a society based on human dignity, equality, and freedom. How far are we on this journey as a society? So plot for yourself uh, as a little exercise. You see, this is where I think we are. In fact, I look at it now and I almost feel like I've been too generous and that, that red dot should be far closer to that point X because I don't think we as a society actually understand each other. See, our constitution requires us as a, as a society to walk together holding hands almost from point X to point Y. And the reason that I think we haven't even got out of the starting blocks Sorry, I'm, my mouth's so dry. Yeah. Um, the reason why we haven't got out of the starting blocks is because we keep tripping at our first hurdle. And that first hurdle, ladies and gentlemen, is race, is black and white. And the reason that we're tripping is because we're blindfolded. This is a discussion about race, ladies and gentlemen, and if you're feeling uncomfortable about, uncomfortable about it, then I, I thought that maybe I would start off um, and introduce myself again. <laughs> My name is Roy Glackman. I'm a 26-year-old male. I'm white. For 10 of my 12 years of schooling, I attended a top private school in this country. I attained two university degrees from the top university on the continent, and I now work at one of the top law firms in the country. I'm privileged. I was born into privilege. See, we as white South Africa, we don't like this term a beneficiary of apartheid. And I can understand why. I can understand why, why we don't like it. Beneficiary would imply that we had a vested interest in something, that we had um, almost a connection to it. And we can understand why we would say, you know, we're not comfortable saying we had this, uh, this kind of um, interest in, in a racially apartheid, in a, in, a, in a racially segregated system. So let's remove the term beneficiary of apartheid. So if we didn't benefit directly from it as white South Africa, there is no way that we can say that we were prejudiced by it, that we had our opportunities thwarted, and that we had our liberties curtailed. That's very important for us as white South Africa to say, fine, you didn't benefit, benefit, it from, benefit from it directly, but we were absolutely not prejudiced by it. Our opportunities were equal. See, that's a very important point for us as white South Africa to start discussing and to own up to our privilege and say that yes, we worked hard. My parents have worked incredibly hard to give me the best education that they could possibly give me. But I cannot reconcile the fact that that privilege was afforded to me in an environment of unequal opportunities based on the color of people's skins. And yes, you guys have all worked very hard and your parents have worked very hard to get to you, to get you here at this TEDx conference. But a large contributing factor to that is that you are white and that we need to own up to that privilege. So essentially, um, my program that I've developed, the Constitutional and Bill of, Bill of, Rights, Constitutional and Bill of Rights program, is developed to little me's. I remember when I was a young adult, um, it's taken me a long time to get to this point of understanding my privilege and of recognizing my privilege. And I remember I was so 
so frightened of this country, you know, I have anxieties about this country, you know, where are we going, the future of this country, my role in this country as a white male, what would this reverse apartheid, how am I supposed to have equal opportunities? And that was really these kind of perceptions which I had, which weren't even my own. They were inherited perceptions. They were perceptions which were my fears of my father, the fears of my mother, of their parents and of my community, which now were, were mine, and I didn't even have a choice to agree with them or disagree with them. Mm. And it was only really late in my, in my adult life, at 22, yeah. that I was forced to deal with my privilege, what it meant to be white. I studied constitutional law at UCT. Uh, I had gone to no lectures. I had attended no lectures. It was an 8 o'clock. It, it was an awful time. Uh, but I had to pass. I had to graduate. So I took the textbook and I sat in my little flat and I read my textbook from start to finish. And I'll never forget those three weeks of my life because it was those three weeks where I began my own transformation. I had to sit down and read about human dignity, equality, and freedom, the values of the Constitution, what it told me as a citizen I needed to do in order to walk this point to why. The commitment it required of me as a South African to look at where we were and understand the idea of inequality and really say, well, obviously it would make sense if we'd have an affirmative action system. We need to redress. But I didn't get it because my inherited perceptions were so, so ingrained. And there I was uprooting as I went along, as I read this textbook from back to front. And I couldn't for the life of me reconcile how is it that at 22 years old, and only because I was studying law at UCT, that I hadn't attended any lectures and had to read the textbook from back to front, that I was for the first time experiencing what it meant to be white and privileged in this country. How is it that the stars had to align in such a way for me to have an experience like I had? It was untenable. So I decided that I needed to build a program to take to little knees, little Roy's in privileged schools, mm -hmm. to give them an education. And, and it's not a formal education. I don't talk about what section nine of the constitution is or what section 10 is. It's a social education. It's an education about our society, which I think is severely lacking in the privileged communities of this country. So I started in Cape Town. Uh, I've taught over 6,000 students in both Joburg and Cape Town at dozens of schools. Uh, and it's been an incredible experience for me. Uh, I came to Joburg, I started working in the corporate world, and I realized that these inherited perceptions are not just for learners. These are for corporates. These are for executives. These are for chairmans because these inherited perceptions are really something we all have. So I've taken it to them and it's been an amazing experience. And there's something which across the board and something which for me was incredibly important and I, that I noticed is this idea of affirmative action being seen as reverse apartheid. I want to talk about this. And I think that the reason why we don't understand it and that we would see it in that way is that we as South Africans do not understand what equality is which is actually quite bizarre given that we've been spoken about equality for our whole lives, you know. We think as South Africans across the board that equality is that everyone must be treated e equally. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that is the absolute furthest truth from what equality is. Equality as defined by the Constitutional Court is treating similar people in similar situations similarly. So in fact, equality is about treating different people differently. Now that is actually incredibly difficult to wrap your mind around when you think about, but hold on a second, we, we're moving from where we were, where people were treated indifferently, to where we want to be. Surely now we should treat everyone equally. No. We have to treat different people differently in order to allow them the same opportunities. Because though it is not impossible, it's rather improbable to think that a high school learner in a township school will be able to achieve the same marks and get into UCT without a little bit of assistance. That they would get the same entrance requirements as somebody going to Crawford College. And it's for those reasons that we need to have this different people treated differently to achieve the same um, opportunities. And a lot of people keep asking me, they say, yes, but 19 years on into our democracy, why do we still have this? Why do we still have this? Surely, you know, we've, we've got to a point, opportunities are equal, we, shouldn't, we need to abandon this, this notion of, of kind of treating people differently. And I think to think that 19 years can make up for over 400 years of oppression 
and racial discrimination and disadvantage is in fact very naive. In fact, I'd actually go as far as to say is it's, it's borderline racist. Because disadvantage is inherited. Much like privilege is inherited, so too is disadvantage. And this kind of ties into the argument when they say, yeah, but what about the born freeze? You know, 19 years in, they had nothing to do with apartheid, both black and white. Why should they now be having um, a, a, unequal treatment why, why do we have to have this kind of this raising of op, uh, this raising of kind of opportunities for those who are disadvantaged when we have a, a society where everyone's equal and the reason being is that we need to understand as South Africans that disadvantage is inherited and that affirmative action and redress is actually not about a generational redress about one generation being born after 1994 but intergenerational redress and it's something that we need to do to understand and to, to come to terms with this idea of redress. Because if we can understand the, the, the real the realities on the ground, and that township schools will never be able to, and or rather improbable, that they will ever be able to achieve marks that private schools can, we can understand why we would need to have a system prolonged as it is. The next thing is people always ask, well, Roy, when will it end? When can we turn around and say we don't need the system anymore? It doesn't make sense to have affirmative action. Everyone's equal, you know, we don't need to kind of give a different, uh, uh, you know, foot up, leg ups for, for certain communities. And this here is what we call the class system, okay? It's a, it's a generic representation going from poor to rich. There's no, no issue with this generally. The problem in South Africa is that our class system runs in correlation to our race divide. So only really when we can de-racialize class will, will we be able to turn our backs on affirmative action. Only when we can say there's an equal spread of race across both poor and rich will we say, well, then there's very little reason for us to have to give different races legs up. Um, but I don't see that happening within the next 50, maybe, maybe even 100 years. And I'm okay with that. You know, a lot of people say to me, but Roy, we're colorblind now. You know, I'm colorblind. I don't see race. You know, I, I, I don't see race anymore. It's not important for me. And I do believe that being colorblind in South Africa in 2013 is the most dangerous thing that we could possibly be. Now is the time for us to be seeing race like we've never seen it before. I don't know how many of you guys have noticed, but six of the eight speakers here are white, and the majority of this audience is white. What does that say about us? What does it say about those people with access to 165 Rand for a ticket? What does it say about us, about the people who don't have access to social media, who, who even found out about this event? What does it say about us as a community 19 years on? We need to be more racialized. We have to start seeing race like we've never seen it before. Going into Constantia, an upper class neighborhood in Cape Town and seeing that it's predominantly white, going into Kailicha Township in Cape Town, seeing that it is almost exclusively black, and saying, well, I don't see color, is actually committing social injustices and allowing the social injustices which run along race lines to be perpetuated, to disallow the race segregation to merge with our class segregation. So I really do think that as South Africans, we need to take the blindfold off. We need to start meeting race head on and saying, this is something which is real in our country. This is a hurdle where we're stumbling every time on our point from X to Y, to a society based on human dignity, equality, and freedom. And it really is. And I'm actually really glad that I'm speaking to this audience and that you are white, that the majority of you are white, because you are my target audience. Because I think we need to hear this, and we need to own our privilege, and we need to start seeing race and understanding how this class system actually works and how it perpetuates inherited disadvantage and inherited advantage. So I'd really ask everyone here to own your privilege, to understand why you're here, to really be conscious of the social injustice that still runs along race lines, and start kind of letting go of the fear that we have around the future of this country, that better understand what it is that we're dealing with. Thank you very much. That's it. I hope you guys uh, enjoyed it.